Book of Romans, second chapter. We've been here for two months or longer. It may take a year to get through Romans. It's such a tremendous book. I told you this when we started. If I had one book out of the Bible that I could take, uh, I would take Romans. If they would only let me have one to choose because it has so much. It, it, deal, it, it deals with every facet of our life. Uh, we're gonna. I like to rehearse. I don't know whether you do or not, but I found out learning is is perpetual rehearsing. You do it over and over and over and over again. Before long, it becomes part of you and it's in your mind. It's like A B C, one two three. It took a long time for me to finally get that. I think I was about the twelfth grade before I really got that part of it down. So rehearsal is a good thing. When Paul writes uh, to the church at Rome, this church was started the best that anyone can find out uh, right after Christ was crucified. Now you remember when Jesus was crucified, that persecution came against the Christians so much that they dispersed. If persecution had not come against the Christians, I promise you, the gospel would have gotten no further than Jerusalem. They would have all stayed right there and enjoyed the praises of God. But because of the persecution, they dispersed and they began to go all over the world. And that's the reason that we have uh, salvation here in America now, because somebody left. But it all started in Jerusalem. It's the center of the world. And think on this, that it started in Jerusalem and that it lived in Jerusalem. We think that Jesus Christ is white. I always observed him as being white. I thought maybe he was from Ballard County. <laughs> well, we observed these things, but now he wasn't. And I found this out when we were in Jerusalem. There's a, a people there that are called Bedouins, and they are Jews. But those are the ones that live in the desert and have herds of sheep and cattle. And they're black. So that leaves to mind, hey, what's the color of Jesus? Makes no difference. Strip of the skin, we're all red. Cut, we all bleed. Marvelous thing about bleeding, it's blue before it comes out. I was at the hospital the other day, and a lady sitting there, and we was talking about blood, and uh, Somebody made the comment, said, well, it's blue. She said, it is not. I said, look at your veins. Your veins are blue. Change blood. So when oxygen hits, it, it turns red. I just thought I'd throw that in. That didn't, didn't cost any extra. But the Christian dispersed. Some went to Jerusalem, and they started the work of God, and they built the work of God. Now, at this particular time, the best I can figure out and understand, when the churches started, it started in houses. They did not go out and, and rent a cathedral. They didn't build nice churches and put a sign up, uh, Sunday school at so-and-so, preaching services Wednesday night. They didn't do that. And from all that you read in the book of Acts about the early church, when they had church, they had church. They might start up a morning and it ends a week later, two or three months later, I mean, they had church. It was something that they, how they worshiped God. So when he writes the Rome or the church at, at Rome, he explains some things. He talks about that he was saved by the blood of Jesus. He was called to be an apostle and uh, called to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then the righteousness of God is revealed in one person, and that's Jesus Christ. And he says that the people that are born on this earth, if they've never heard about Jesus, that they are still accountable to God. And he explains it like this. He said even the things that God has created has put them in the position that they are without excuse. There's not a person that has ever lived on this earth 
that if he looks at the stars, the moon, the sun, the grass, the trees, the rivers, the streams, the seas, and the ocean, all the animals, they have to understand that there has got to be a creator and a maker and a designer. It just didn't happen. So he said, even nature teaches us that there is a God. And they are without excuse because if they understand that there's a God and looked in that direction, God will make them, them available to preaching or hearing the word of God that they can be saved. So they're without excuse. The Jewish nation, uh, they had the law, but the, what they did, they chose not to follow after God. They emptied themselves of God. And he gives us the first example. And he says because they, they did that, that they changed the natural use of a man and a woman. Men turned to men, women turned to women, homosexuality started, and God gave them over to a reprobate mind. And all that means is they could do whatever seemed right in their own eyes. Now, I want to add something I hadn't added because it just happened yesterday. We know that now it is legal and it is the law that women can marry women and men can marry men. We said before, because they pass the law does make does not make it right in the eyes of God. And as far as I am, being a Christian, I still do not believe that women are to marry women and men are to marry men. I don't believe that. Now, that happened last week, and I told you about it. A couple, I think, in for Iowa, they were uh, opened a bakery where that they baked cakes, pies, and catered weddings. A homosexual couple, two lesbians came in, wanted them to cater the wedding. They wouldn't do them. They took them to court. They sued them. And the government, uh, the judge came down that the fine on this couple was $135,000. That's what they're going to have to pay because they rejected. I told you this. This is going to come real quick and I believe this, I'm not a prophet, but according to the way things are going, somebody will go to an evangelical pastor that loves God, a lesbian or a homosexual, and they will ask that person to marry them, and that person will refuse, and they will sue them, I promise you, and drag them into court. This is how they're going to come to the church. Now, yesterday, a lady from California can't remember her name. She is a Congress lady. And she introduced the bill that you no longer could say husband and wife. That it would become illegal. In your marriage ceremonies, you cannot say, I pronounce you husband and wife. You cannot, this is her bill, you cannot say, I pronounce you man and wife. This is what her bill says. That they are to be called couples or spouse. What do you think? She must be gay herself. Now, that's not far-fetched, folks. I mean, this is... It's out in left field for us. But now you think of the world. The world will say that that's all right. And before long, we don't have any men and women in Congress and Senate and government that have a backbone. They do not. They'll stand up and they'll tell you they're Christians and you'll see them make an appearance in church. But when it comes down to standing for God, they are jellyfish. That's coming. So he said he gave them over to a reprobate mind. Second chapter begins that we are without excuse uh, of, of not knowing God because he made himself available. The, the, our forefathers chose to empty themselves of God and to do what they wanted to do. Now, this is where we're at. Every man sees 
what he does is right in his own eyes. That's called justification. If you slap my jaws, I'll slap your jaws. That's called justification. Jesus said, if somebody slaps you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. Now that's not only physical things, but it also gets down, if somebody says something about you, Stand up and take it again. You don't have to retaliate and be ignorant. It took me a long time to learn to quit being ignorant. That's my favorite word. The Bible uses it a lot. Paul says it like this. If any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. There's no pill you can take for ignorance. You can't go get a shot for it. So we've got a lot of ignorant people in this world. And a lot of people choose to be ignorant. So if somebody says something to you that offends you, don't let her rip right back to them. Just tell them I love you. Pray for me that I won't offend you anymore. I'm sorry if I offended you. And let me tell you how that works. Barbara and I used to, years ago, even after we got saved, we never physically came to blows. But we would talk loud to each other. And I always had my hammer pulled back on my gun, ready to shoot any time she said anything to me. And she had hers pulled, cocked, ready to go. And so one night, she said something to me, and boy, it hit me, and I started to just let it rip. And then I remembered this is what I said. You have hurt my feelings. She is ready to fire back at me because she knew what I always did. But I didn't react. For every action, there's a reaction. And the blood drained from her face. She got white. And she said, well, I'm sorry. Now, isn't that a good way to handle things? Isn't that a good way? Now, if I'd have reacted... She would have reacted, and then we'd have been into it. She would have slept on the couch, or I'd have slept on the couch, or she'd have been in one bedroom, and I'd have been in the one bedroom. The next morning, I'd have got up and left before she got up, or she'd have got up and left before I got up. Does that sound familiar? Have you ever experienced anything? Folks, recognize how the devil works. You don't have to react. I don't know why we're getting off there. Must be somebody needs it. If then nobody needs it, it's just old crow. We don't act that way anymore. You watch us go home and have a confrontation. If it is, I'm coming to your house. If I knock on your door, you let me in. I'm going to stay all night week. And I like biscuits and gravy and eggs. It's all sexual for breakfast. I'll go to Brian's house. Yeah. So he will cook breakfast for me. Brian, I'm coming to your house. <laughs> so he says that all of us are going to appear before the judgment seat of God. The conclusion of this of the first chapter and the second chapter is this that God does not respect people. He cares not if you're rich or poor, if you're tall or short, if you're if you're white or black, God does not cute. He does not respect people for who they are. The only thing that he respects and accepts is the one that accepts his son. And the one accepts Jesus Christ, then God accepts into the family of God, adopts him into the family of God, and he comes a Jew by nature, a born-again Christian. All right, we're ready for the 17th verse. Behold... Thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thou boast of God. Now he's talking to the, to the Jews now. These Jews, they are in the church at Rome. And the problem is this, that they think because they are Jews, and because that God gave Moses a law, which Moses was a Jew, and all the twelve tribes of Israel were Jews, and God chose the Jews, and all the children of, of the Jewish nation belonged of God, 
They thought just because I'm a Jew and have the law of Moses, then I'm all right with God. But God's already told us that God is no respecter of persons, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There are three things in that 17th verse I want you to really look at. He says, thou art called a Jew. Now that's number one. They were God's chosen people. God chose them as his people. He didn't choose anybody else. So there's two kinds of people besides saved and lost. There are Jews and there are Gentiles. If you're not a Jew, then you are a Gentile. So the people was the, in the church, the Jewish sect of people, he says, thou art called a Jew and resteth in the law. So their foundation and their uh, confidence was in the law of Moses. Why? Because that God chose Israel as his people and he gave Israel the law. So in their minds, they were preaching and teaching in the church that since we are Jews and God gave us the law, comes the uh, third thing, and make us thy boast of God. So they were boasting. We are above the rest of you people in the church because we are, the, we are Jews and God gave us the law and so they boasted of who they are. Now I always have a problem with this, this kind of people. The ones that, are, that tell me and tell you they're more spiritual than I am. Always have a problem with those kind of people. People that give an air off that they're holier than you. You ever run across any of them? These folks has got their nose in the air, and if it rained, they'd drown. They're holy. Oh, I am so holy. I... You're not holy. The only holiness that you've got is the blood of Jesus that's on you. That's the only thing holy about you. Your body is not holy. It's the temple of God which houses your soul. And then your soul has been saved and he has sealed you, your soul, by the Holy Spirit of God when he wrote your name in heaven. So that's your only holiness. But the problem in the church at Rome was that the Jews thought they were holier than everybody else because they were a Jew and God had given Moses a law and it's handed down to them. And so they were going around with the nose in the air. I'm better than you. I'm better than you. I'm holier than you. I'm, a, I'm closer to God than you because I'm a Jew, I'm a Jew, I'm a Jew. We find that in our world. I'm a Baptist, I'm a Baptist, I'm a Baptist. I'm a Pentecost, I'm a Pentecost, I'm a Pentecost. I'm, I'm a Catholic. I'm... What does that mean? 18th verse. And know us his will. Now he's giving reference back 17th verse. The Jews knew that they were God's chosen people. And the Jews knew the will of God, knew his will, and approve us the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. He said, all right, you're God's chosen people. You know what God wants you to do. Now, how did the Jews know the will of God?
He said, all right, since you're Jews, since you've had the law, you've been instructed of the law, you've got an obligation. And what is that obligation? You are a guide of the blind. You are a light of them which are in darkness. So the Jewish nation had an obligation. And their obligation was to live an exemplary life before the Gentile world because the world was in darkness and the Jews were walking in the light of God and they had an obligation to let them see God in them. Now that's where we're at today. The people in Paducah and Kevel and Barlow and Gage and Oscar and Bandana and Blanville and all around us, there is a multitude that do not come to church. And the only thing about God that they ever see and hear is you and me. So we are a light to the ones that are in darkness. Now you can always tell a Christian if you listen to them and if you watch their lives, they will always expose themselves to the world. How? They won't act like the world. They are different. They'll stick out like a sore thumb. So our lives as Christians, we know the will of God. We've been born again of the Spirit of God. And so we are a guide of the blind to bring them to the light because they're in darkness. So the church at Rome had the Jews boasted of God but there was a problem. They were not living it. So that tells us if we're going to be a light to people that are lost, we got to live what we say. If we don't live what we say, then those people will never know and never see what we're confessing and professing in our lives. Because I guarantee you, most of them is not going to walk through a church door. And I've witnessed to hundreds of people since I've been back here around our area. And almost without exception, I've heard this, not maybe a few. Well, I'm not going to be a hypocrite, first time. If you see me go to church, I'm not going to be a hypocrite because I know so-and-so that goes to church and they do everything that I do and I'm not going to be a hypocrite. Now, does that sound familiar? I'm almost done now. Don't, don't, I don't want to lose you. 20th verse, an instructor. So we're not only to be light, the Jews were not only to be light, we're not only to be light, but we're to be instructors of the foolish. Somebody tell me what the foolish are. No. Ignorant. See, they think what we got is foolishness. And we know before we got saved, everything we did was foolishness. Because everything that we did before we got saved was for self-gratification. We wanted to do it because we wanted to do it because it did about us or it felt good or we just liked it. So he says that the Jews, you need to be instructors. A teacher of babes. Now that's a good thing. When should we start teaching people about Jesus? A teacher of babies. Babies. Now, if you raise your kids in church, and if you got a preacher worth 15 cents that will minister the Word of God to them, and you teach them at home, and you live the life before them, you're going to be a drawing force of them to God because you're projecting light into the darkness that the world tries to feed them. Now listen to me carefully. This day and time, especially when a kid goes to school, starts school, and goes all the way through college, all that person is going to be exposed to is nothing but the world and somebody's ideology. 
That's why it's important for you as a parent, you as a grandparent, you as an uncle or aunt or whoever you might be, is to spend some time teaching. We have one daughter left. They are getting back in church. Man, I have prayed and prayed and prayed and I have preached to her. I tell her, honey, I don't mean to preach to you, but bless God, here to go again. And she said, I know, Daddy. I know, Daddy. I said, honey, the only reason I'm telling you this is because I know. I know. I understand. I know, Daddy. I'm not, I said, I don't mean to be preaching to you, but I can't help it. I'm going again. And here we go again. And it's finally, finally. And I told her the other day, I said, do one thing for yourself. Get up Sunday morning. And I know your husband is supposed to lead the way but her husband's not saved. And I said, you put your clothes on and you go to church. You go to church the next Sunday and the next Sunday and the next Sunday and don't open your mouth to it. Don't say a word. Don't invite them. Don't beg them. If they say, where are you going? Say, I'm going to church. And I promise you, I promise you that one day, somewhere, somehow, they will follow along. And I believe that with all my heart. Somebody has got to be the example. You lead your children by doing. Now listen carefully. You cannot take your kids to church and teach them one thing and then go home and be somebody else. It won't work because they hear what you're saying, but they see what you're doing. I told my girls when they was little, I said, anything you hear your daddy say, you can say. And you're talking about tying your feet to the fire or something. And I said, anything you see me do, you can do. There have been many times I wished I hadn't said that. When I started on the road the first year by myself and uh, Barbara and the girls came the next year and we were headquartered in St. Louis and I had been in to get something, I don't know, and they were helping me carry my stuff back to put it on the bus and I had taught Sam to spit when she was big enough to walk. And here I was, had my arms full, she was alongside me and I started to step up and had my shoes shine and she said, and right on my shoe. Well, I was flumming my things around where I could swat her. And Barbara said, you taught her how. I had to get the things back up and take it. Don't ever ask your kids, who did you hear say that? They was listening at the door that you had closed.
21st verse, Thou thyforth which teacheth another. Now I like this part. Here I am, and I'm teaching you. What does that mean to me, and what does that mean to you? If I'm the teacher, and you're the listener, so the Jews were the teachers because they were God's people, chosen people, the light of the world, had the knowledge of the truth from the law. Thou thou force which teach another teachest thou not thyself. So when I'm instructing, when I'm preaching God's word, it means the same for me as it does for you. I'm not outside the pot. I'm in the pot. We're all in the same pool. We're all in the same world. So when I preach to you, any time that I might say you, remember, I'm included in you. We're all together. So he says, if you uh, teach another, don't you teach yourself also? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, does thou steal? Now, if I got up here every week and hammered down on how you are to live your life, however the God is instructing you, I have to take those same instructions. I have to live like you live. Whatever I do, I should not expect you to do otherwise. So, say this. I get up and preach today, tonight, thou shalt not steal. And in the morning, it's all over the news that Glenn robbed the First National Bank in Paducah. And my picture would be on Channel 6 and be in the Paducah Sun. How many of you would claim me? I got two that are claiming the rest of you just on it. But now see what I'm talking about? What I tell you, I've got to do it myself. We are all the same in the eyes of God. There are no difference between us. So if I'm telling you, don't you give anybody a cussing, and then you hear that I went downtown the center and give somebody a cussing at Mimi's Pizza, <laughs> it don't work that way. So, as a church in Rome, the problem was they was not living by the word of God. They were telling everybody else how to live, and they were not doing it themselves. Now, I like that part of the 22nd verse. Thou, thou, thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, does thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, do thou commit sacrilege? Thou that maketh thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonoreth thy God. Now let's go back for a minute. The time, and I'm hesitant to use it, but I'm going to use it anyway. The whole world knows it. Jimmy Swaggart, one of the most prominent evangelists in years in our country and in the world. We were in St. Louis at the time I was on the road when he was. And I got to listening to Jimmy Swagger. And there for about six months before it came out on him what he was doing, every time that he would preach, he, this was his message. No matter where he read his text, it always come out in the message. That I have never smoked a cigarette in my life. I said, well, that's good. I have never tasted liquor, nor beer, nor wine in my life. I said, well, that's good. I've never been in a dance hall in my life. I said, that's good. I've never cursed in my life. The only woman that I've ever been with is my wife. And he would, every week he'd list the same thing. After about two months, I told Barbara, I said, I'll tell you one thing. I said, that big boy's fooling around. Let me give you some wisdom. Any time that a preacher continually repeats and preaches the same thing over and over, or a Christian always is happy.
pounding on the same thing over and over, I promise you that's what they're doing. I'm an old man, been in it a long time. I promise you that's what they're doing. Because, see, the Spirit of God exposes you. What you're doing comes out in your life and through your speech. If you're living for God and you're loving God, you're going to spit it out. And if the devil's got a foothold on you, you can't help yourself but spit it out. Because <laughs> that's what you got up there in your mind. And then you'll expose yourself. Are you all right with that? Yeah. It'll happen. It'll work that way. So it said if you're uh, thou shalt not commit adultery, does thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, does thou commit sacrilege? Now, I like this part. If you cannot stand idols, he's telling the Jews, they knew they were not to have any graven image before them, that God was the only true and living God, that they were to worship him and worship him only. He said, all right, you hate people with idol worship, and you hate idols that have been given to other God. But he said, you commit sacrilege. To commit sacrilege means that you go in these other places and you steal from them. That means the Jewish nation, they would, they would overrun a temple of a heathen God and they would take the things out of that temple and bring it home with them. Now do you remember back in the Old Testament that when Israel went into the land of Egypt and he would tell the, uh, the leaders and the Egypt, uh, Israelites when they went into a city to destroy everything in that city, not to touch anything or bring it home with them. So he said, if you're telling somebody how to live, you better make sure you're living it yourself. Let that be uh, your walk and not, and not just your speech. Uh, he says, Thou makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law, dishonor to God. So they were saying, you know, we've got the law, we're Jews, but they live not what the law said. So he said, by doing that, you're dishonoring God. So we as a church, if, we, if we're saying we love God, and continue on in sin, doing wrong things out here, the same thing over and over and over again, he said, you're dishonoring God. You're bringing dishonor to God because you're saying that you're a child of God. Now notice this. If we do that, then we're saying that it's all right if we sin because God is all right with it. And God's not all right. But that's what we project to the world. That's what they see uh, out of us, and that's what was happening at Rome. 24th verse, we're, we'll shut down here in a second. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. Now, somebody expound to me for just a minute when it says, as it is is written. Where is it written that God is blasphemed by his people's actions? That's right. That's right. Well, you're close. Second Samuel. Okay. Almost. Almost. Second Samuel. I think it's the 12th chapter and the 14th verse. You remember when David committed adultery with Bathsheba? He brought her up to his house after he had her husband killed. God sent Nathan to David and exposed David's sins to him. This is what Nathan told David, God told David, 12th chapter, 14th verse, How be it, because by thy deed thou hast given great occasion 
to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. So, that's why people say, I'm not going to church down there because everybody is hypocrites in that church. Well, I used to say that. I'm going to shut up right here. Before I got saved, because of incidents that happened when I was young, a little kid in church, I made a point. If I could go out with somebody in church, married or single, that's what I would do. You know why? Simply because I wanted to prove to myself that those people were hypocrites. If I could get a deacon to get drunk with me, I loved it. Because I could prove to myself that he was a hypocrite. You see what I'm talking about? So every church building that houses people that are saved, we are a light to the world. And whatever we profess that we are and believe, we got to live that kind of life. Does that mean you won't sin? No, you will sin sometime or another in your life. But it does mean that you won't continually get in there and just keep on doing the same thing over and over and over. you get that right. And you'll get right with God. Because God is, our job is to project God and light to the world. That's our job. That wasn't taking place in Rome. The problem was they had it, but they didn't have it. They had the light, but they wouldn't let it shine. They thought they were better than everybody else. Never think that you're better than anybody else because you got saved. If you're saved, you will think, like Paul did, among sinners I'm chief. You'll think you're the smallest and the lowest in the kingdom of God because you have been saved by the grace of God. Now, I said you to, for you to do this, I'm going to tell you to do it again. I want you to look up the word circumcision and find everything you can about it, and I'll guarantee you it's going to prove you what it is. Number one, I'm going to touch this and then I'm going to leave. I'll close my Bible already, I promise. What is circumcision? Why did God institute circumcision? I always heard, well, it was cleanliness. God was uh, telling the Jews that it was cleanliness. And then I've heard, well, uh, it was a covenant. Well, what is that covenant? Now, you study on this. Now, I mean, dig, 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 because circumcision is not what you think that it is. Not in the particular meaning of it in the scriptures. Okay, y'all go home and get you a good night's sleep. Rest up.